Do you track your macros? Macros? I do not. Any reason why not? I hate it. <laughs> you hate uh, the process of tracking yes. or macros? I, no, I don't hate macros. <laughs> okay. All of my elite athletes track their macros. Yeah. Um, the, like literally, I mean, the, the, if we're going out to, if we're going to Whole Foods for lunch and we go to the salad bar, before they put it in that cardboard tray, they put it on a scale. Yep. They're like literally like they're weighing and measuring everything, and because they go out to eat, it doesn't change. Like they're my lead athletes do it for sure. We've had a lot of people in our gym have tremendous, tremendous results from tracking macros. I hate it, yeah. so I don't do. It. We are here because we know the outcomes in our lives are within our control. That taking absolute ownership of how we eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with each other is how we'll optimize our health and happiness. That chasing excellence is how we grab hold of what is possible. Our mission is to Five, live on the run, four, always three, chasing, two, never one, stop. Go. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Chasing Excellence. How are you, Ben? I'm doing good. Thanks, Patrick. Today we are going to do um, one of my favorite things, which is another two-minute drill. Uh, for those folks who are new, welcome. Uh, Two-minute drill is when I collect a bunch of questions from listeners, um, sort through them, find some questions that I think would be fun and challenging for you to, to answer within a, within two minutes, which we um, we are very, very serious about. Um, mm. uh, shot and clock. Yes, a shot clock. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. Um, I think this is the 10th time we've done a two-minute drill, which is cool. So the questions all uh, certainly fall within the gamut of things that we talk about, but beyond that, they are relatively random. Um, so for folks who want to submit questions, the easiest way and the best way so far is to just find me on Instagram, uh, P.S. Cummings, uh, and just drop me a DM or a note, um, and I will get to them uh, as quickly as I can. So thanks to everybody who sends me questions. I do, uh, I do read every single one of them, so thank you. Um, so the first one, if I'm looking to gain muscle weight... How much extra hypertroph hypertrophic hypertrophic? I know what he's that? talking about. So it's uh, how much extra hypertrophic work should be added to programming? <clears throat> okay, for those that don't know what that is, it's how much extra work should I be doing focusing on growing my muscles? Yeah. And <laughs> bad answer, but correct answer is depends. Yeah. And I I hate that answer because <laughs> everything depends, but it really does. Like how much extra muscle growth are you looking for? If you're looking to compete in a bodybuilding competition, we're gonna do a lot. If you wanted to add a pound or two over the next four to six months, probably very little, if any, is needed. You're mm -hmm. going to do that anyway. So let me kind of like give a uh, two two different options there. First one, if you want to add some above and beyond the normal CrossFit training, at the end of your training session, do one set. I'm sorry, one exercise of um, like three sets of ten of a compound movement, but um, something we probably don't see. And so like. Pick a similar movement. Let's so say we're doing burpees that day. Well, that's an upper body pushing in a horizontal plane, like think push up. Yep. Let's also do three sets of 10 bench press. And let's also pick an accessory um, movement to back that up more in isolation fashion. So let's also do uh, two or three sets of higher reps of 10 to 25 um, skull crushers, mm -hmm. something like that. That would be like on the lower end. You're looking to add some extra muscle. Cool. Let's do one compound movement in addition to the, the Metcon and let's do uh, one or two extra accessory movements. And then from there, it swings to the higher end of the spectrum. If you're looking to actually do a bodybuilding competition, pare down the Metcon a little bit and then do two or three bench press, incline press, shoulder press, and then also two or three additional isolation movements. Mm -hmm. So you want to take what maybe as maybe in that former one, take a, a movement similar to what you've done in yep. the Metcon and add to it by, and, and I guess exactly. the question is, don't do something different. Exactly. Just do the additional thing because what you're going to end up doing if you do something different is you're going to run into what's coming up tomorrow. Got it. Got it. Okay, next question. I recently had a family friend contact me uh, recently explaining that she quit collegiate swimming to focus on school. She wants to stay active and loves CrossFit, wants to take the, uh, her competitive drive in that direction. My concern is that she has a classic swimmer's upper cross. Which I don't actually know what that is. Uh, poor posture, et cetera. Um, as a friend, I want, to, I want her to join me in the gym uh, for higher level training in addition to class. But as a trainer, I want her to have her focus on fixing the upper cross and posture issue so that we don't create larger back and shoulder problems. Thoughts or suggestions? Okay. Um, upper cross syndrome is what other people would call like kyphosis. It's like just a, it's a really crappy posture. Got it. It's rounding of the shoulders, protruding head in front of the shoulders. Um, think of like the old man that can't lift anything above his head or unfortunately now think of the the 22 year old kid who's been addicted to his phone and social media in his lap underneath mm -hmm. his desk kind of that crouch position yep. it's 
it's a terrible position. So it's not, I mean, she, he's saying it's a classic swimmer's thing. I don't think it's a classic swimmer thing. Um, you know, it can be from tight shoulders and overworked. Here's the, here's the quick answer yeah. to it. Crossover symmetry. Oh, interesting. Okay. So that's what this is about. This is about restoring shoulder function. So do crossover symmetry and do it incredibly well. It's the nuancy parts of the movement. You're doing physical therapy. So think about if you're a physical therapy setting, the attention to the mechanics that they would bring to it. Don't do it to complete it. Do it to improve shoulder function and do it at least once a day, if not twice a day. Mm. And would you recommend in his position as a trainer and probably helping her into this position, like do crossover symmetry before anything yes. else? Like so that's you do, the, you do, there's different protocols. You yep. can do the activation protocol beforehand, and then you can just do the activation protocol again afterwards as a resetting of it. But there are other ones as well, things that would make you stronger like scap jacked and there's a plyometric unit just mm -hmm. just get really good at the activation and do it at least once a day before training and if you can do it additionally afterwards added bonus points and any benefit to having her wait to do more training in other words like let's do this for three months and then we can start depends on how bad it is okay. right if yeah. she's going to get her hurt if she can't put something above her head yeah. then yes then more important if she that. just has like a little bit of you know a rounded shoulder but she can still get through all functional ranges of motion then no, let's let's train. Let's have fun. Got it. Okay, so the next two questions are similar, different, but similar enough that I'm going to um, uh, put them together. First one, if I'm having a bad day, should I lie to the people who ask me how, how it's going? <laughs> uh, where is the line between being real and being whiny? Okay, so we have a principle, which is truth above all else. I, I think after hearing that question, maybe I need to amend that. Mm. Because what comes above that is never whine, never complain, never make excuses. And here's the reason why. So if somebody says like, how's it going today? And you're like, really shitty. I slept really terrible last night. My kid was up and I feel like I'm coming out with a cold. What you're doing there is you're reinforcing the things that you should be focusing on. And your mind is being centered and like lasered in on that. Well, guess what's going to manifest itself throughout the day is those feelings of tiredness, being pissed off, grouchy, and all the rest. It's called... A lot of different names, but let's call it frequency illusion, which is what you look for, you see more of. You're going to buy a new pickup truck. What do you start to see a ton of on the road? Pickup trucks everywhere, right? You're going to get new sh um, shrubs in front of your house. All of a sudden, you're paying attention to everyone's shrubs in front of the house. What you look for, you see more of. If you're reinforcing the fact that like, I feel crappy, I feel crappy, and you're thinking it all the time you're going to feel worse. Mm -hmm. What you need to do is break the chain. Your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions. Your actions will dictate the destiny of that day. So what you need to do is break it at the words. If you think it, it's really hard to change the thoughts. And mm -hmm. we're not gonna start there. We can get there later on, but that's kind of like advanced class. Yep. For right now, we're just gonna stop it at the words. Don't speak it. Never whine, never complain, never make excuses. If somebody says, how's it going today? And you feel like crap, be like, I'm battling, man. I'm doing it. I'm battling hard. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, like you're not saying it's sunshine and rainbows. I'm not saying like pretend that there's unicorns running in your backyard, put you know bows on piles of crap. That's not the idea. The idea is to reframe it. And if you can reframe it, now you're changing the direction of your life. Next question. I'd love to hear more in your take the, of the difference between self or honest self-assessment and self-criticism. Is there a way to tell the difference? Yeah. Are you learning from it? So if you are not learning from it, if you're if you're saying like, man, I really screwed up that presentation, and the next thoughts are like, I suck, right? That's criticism, and that's going to lead to a downward spiral that nobody wants to be in, and you're not. There's no benefit to that. If you go, man, I really screwed up that presentation. What could I do better next time? Yep. It's as simple as that. Are you learning from this, or are you doing this to beat yourself up? Let's stay on the side of learning, because if you do. Let's make mistakes. We we had a retreat last week where mm. we pulled the team away, yep. and it came to light that during the retreat, um, we made a mistake. One of, we we didn't involve one of our key team members in a decision that she should ultimately have the biggest because she's the most talented person in this area. Mm -hmm. um, we're redoing a logo, so um, she's the most creative. She's the uh, has the most um, insight in this, and she wasn't involved in the later stage of the process. And when that came up, it was not like, 
let's beat ourselves up. It's like, awesome guys, let's, this is a new opportunity for us to hone in on our decision-making process. And we use that as an experience literally to rewrite the processes of making decisions. And now we are so much, we're so much more dialed in and lined up for the next one. Had we never made that mistake, we'd still be in the same place. If that never comes to light. We don't celebrate that success. I literally, when it happened, I was like, awesome. This is so cool that this came up now. Like, mm-hmm. No, it's not life or death. We're going to be so much better going forward. Yep. Don't beat ourselves up over it. Learn from it. How would you differentiate yourself as a professional trainer in the low-wage CrossFit trainer market? Get results. Mm. Excellence is hard to keep quiet. If you feel like you're underpaid, you're not. You can charge what you're worth. So if that's a question, like I'm, it sounds like yep. low-wage, like how do I earn more money? Yep. Get results. Like if you get 600 people to lose 100 pounds, guess what? You're not going to have an issue like, you're not going to have an issue like charging money for that. If you get 10 people to finish in the top 10 at the CrossFit Games, guess what? You're not going to, now if you haven't achieved those results and you're looking to how to increase your, dude, I mean, it's, it's, it's embrace harsh realities, get results. Do you track your macros? Macros? I do not. Any reason why not? I hate it. <laughs> you hate uh, the process of tracking yes. or macros? I, no, I don't hate macros. <laughs> okay. All of my elite athletes track their macros. Yeah. Um, the, like, literally, I mean, the, the, if we're going out to, if we're going to Whole Foods for lunch and we go to the salad bar, before they put it in that cardboard tray, they put it on a scale. Yep. They're like literally like they're weighing and measuring everything, and because they go out to eat, it doesn't change. Like they're. My lead athletes do it for sure. We've had a lot of people in our gym have tremendous, tremendous results from tracking macros. I hate it. Yeah. So I don't do it. Got it. Strip- I've tried it and I've tried it. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not going to knock it if, unless I've tried it. And I've I've tried it and every 18 months, I'm like, I should do it again. Yeah. I, I, I reinforce the fact that I hate it. <laughs> uh, strict versus kipping for any movement. Benefits of both strict first, then you can kip. Is it safer and smarter to do everything strict? Um. Is it safer and smarter? It's um, potentially. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about benefits first and we'll come back to that. The benefits of strict is there's more strength involved. The benefits of kipping is there's more fitness involved. So kipping is a is a function of involving more of the body. Now let's use pull-ups for an example, right? So if you can do um, 15, let's say, let's how, how long would it take you to do 15 strict pull-ups? Maybe that's your max, mm-hmm. right? It might take you, if it's one second up, a little bit of a pause on the way down, it might take you about you know, 25, 35 seconds to do 15 strict uh, pull-ups. To do those kipping, it might take you 12 seconds, yep. right? Well, power is work over time. How much load are you lifting? How long did, uh, and how far did you go? That's work, load times distance. Then we're gonna divide that by time. So the higher the the work over time ratio, the greater the power. Power is a direct correlate to intensity. Intensity is the independent variable most commonly associated with variable adaptations. In English, what that means is, if you increase the intensity, you get better results. Now results in this area being fitness. If you wanna get stronger, don't kip, Mm -hmm. you want to do it strict. But if you want to get more fit, like ability to do work at a high heart rate, kip. And people are like, well, that's not, it makes total sense. You're using just, all you're doing is using the rest of your body. If in that case, what we should do is tell people that don't want to kip, when you go out for your 400 meter runs, put your hands in your pocket. Mm. (laughs) That's strict running. You are running strict. We're just supposed to use your lower body when you run. Why would you use your arms? Because it makes it a total body movement. Why does it do that? Because you can increase your power. You can go faster. That's the reason we do that. Mm -hmm. So it's not a right or wrong thing. It's what's the end goal we're looking for. If you're looking for strength, and I would and say, yes, safety, strict. If you're looking for fitness and speed, like you would be when you're running, or total results, leaner body mass and all the rest, kip. Mm -hmm. Would it come down to, um, I mean, is, is the ultimate answer like you should be doing both? at the appropriate time or yes, is there, so for sure it feels right? like it feels like there's a hierarchy of, of okay so what should you do first like, and stuff like yeah, that kind of it just feels like once you learn to kip like that's that nobody ever goes backwards from there oh no and, oh and, i and disagree it, with that yeah and i think that yeah. yeah i think that that's kind of my question is yeah 
to go back to our conversation about RXing and not RXing workouts, like, is this a question of what is the intent here? What is your intent? What is the intent of the workout? Whatever. And then choose the appropriate tool. Our for elite athletes, the people that are competing at the top 10 of the games do strict pull-ups three times a week. Mm -hmm. So to say that you should never go backwards, yeah. if that's backwards, I I would just counter that completely. Like yep. we should be building up strength in that that movement pattern for sure. Um, it's something that we should, I think everybody should be doing in conjunction with each other, dot, 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 like kind of based on your goals. Right. If you're a 65-year-old, um, you should not be doing butterfly pull-ups. Right. Like it's just not the right thing yeah. to be doing. If you're competing at the CrossFit Games, like I really hope you're working on butterfly pull-ups. Right. Um, and strict kind of lives, everybody should be living in the strict world as well because there's times that you might not be able to do a kipping pull-up that you should be doing a strict. Got it. All right, next one. Uh, I love it all. I want to look hard and dense. I love it all too. I love it all too. I want to look hard and dense like a bodybuilder, strongman type strength, explosiveness of a weightlifter, and the motor competitiveness and slight craziness of a CrossFitter. Hmm. How would you program for somebody who wants to play across differing training fields, CrossFit, uh, Oli, power, strongman, et cetera? Okay, how would I program for that person? Yeah. Um, first, I would, I would, I would love that because basically like whatever I give them, they're psyched about it. Mm -hmm. um, I would give them CrossFit with extra accessory work playing in each of those things um, a couple days a week. So let's do um, max effort Mondays. So we're gonna do CrossFit workout. Let's jump in the class and do the CrossFit workout. And then we're gonna do max effort Mondays, like West Side guys, right? Yep. We're gonna do super heavy squats and then some accessory work with either maybe some belt squats or safety bar and then some uh, accessory conditioning stuff like pushing sleds or carrying stones. Mm -hmm. Like, cool. Yep. Okay, Tuesdays become like um, target Tuesdays where we're gonna work on like true CrossFit style. We're gonna pick a weakness. We're gonna target your weakness and maybe it's rowing or running or swimming or whatever it might be. And we're gonna target that. Then Wednesday, we're going to do work at Wednesdays. We're going to do some interval training. We're going to jump on a rower. We're going to jump on a bike or we're going to go to the track and do those things. Thursday is probably recovery. And Friday, we'll do um, non-functional Fridays where we lift like a bodybuilder. And mm -hmm. we're going to do bench press and bicep curls and um, tricep push downs and leg extensions. Mm -hmm. And then Saturday becomes big sweat fest Saturday where we do a 60-minute Metcon. And I would just vary it every single day, but I would do it day to day like that. I would not do... Maybe yeah, this person like three months. Off. Yeah, I would not do that. Like that's what I think people um, want to do because, yeah, honestly, because I think it's um, easier. It doesn't hurt as much. Mm. <laughs> it's not as hard. Yeah. Right. It's easier to just kind of live in this powerlifting world, get kind of good at it. Okay, now I'm bored, so now I'm going to do some Olympic lifting. Mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of get good at this, and now I'm bored, so now I'm going to do uh, sign up for a triathlon. I'm going to do some of this until I'm bored. And what you do is you create all these capacities at the fringes, never improving your fitness, mm -hmm. never improving the overall stuff that's going to help you live longer. Yes, compared to a couch potato, yes. Mm -hmm. But compared to the people that are dedicated to work capacity across broad time, mold domains no i would do this on a weekly template base not on a yearly base where i'm doing three months of this and three months of this and three months of this because what you find is you lift one side of the seesaw up so high and by the time you work to bring the other one up that one's come all the way back down right and then we're going to work so hard again and basically you're just kind of like going back and forth instead of bringing capacity instead up of, across the board yeah Next question. I wonder what role investing in aesthetics of the gym or building, not necessarily cleaning, I'm assuming that's a major priority, um, played in brand or plays in branding and how how much to invest in that part of the business versus all of the all of the other aspects of the day to day. Okay, so aesthetics like like facilities, what, like exactly, improving the facility. Exactly. Um Here's, and what was the last part of the question? I, I was kind of thinking about. Uh, how what? much to invest in that as opposed to all of the other aspects of day to day? Okay, so. Where does it live in the in the priorities? High, um, and probably a lot higher than people think. Mm. Your facility is a direct representation and the only physical representation of how much you care. Yep. Everything else 
is by feel. This is the one that we're visual animals that they can look at and say, wow, these guys care. They bought three more rowers this month. Wow, these guys care. They built out another shower. Wow, these guys care. They painted all the walls this year. Wow, these guys care. They ripped up the stall mats and laid down rolled rubber. Wow, these guys care. They did a um, new, uh, new rig for us. Wow, these guys care. The barbells are always working. They're not sticky. Wow, these guys care. There's no dust bunnies or broken down cardboard boxes in the corner that you want to show how much you care. And this is the easy way to do that. How, where does this fall in the day to day? The first thing you want to invest into is your community. And that is, you know, giving people the best hour of their day. The next thing you want to invest into is the actual classes. So whether you call that programming or class management or coaching or mm -hmm. whatever that might be, that's the next place. The next one is this, it's branding. And this is the biggest, most visual, branding is not, Yes, it is. It is your website. And yes, it is your t-shirts. And yes, it is the sign at your door. And yes, it is a lot of those things. Your facility is the easiest one to improve the members feel about mm -hmm. what you're doing and what you're creating. And here's how you do it. It's as simple as those things I just listed. If you're like, I can't do any of those things, go to Home Depot, get a five gallon or whatever it size is, a gallon of paint and repaint a wall. And they just see like, oh, wow, we have a nice clean wall. They're investing into the building. Great. And the next week, like um, do one other small thing that's going to, you know, cost you under 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. And what we should be doing in terms of a budgetary standpoint is basically like you, after you pay your fixed costs, that means your rent and your um, coaching staff salaries and the water bill and the utilities, from there you pay yourself as low as you possibly can. Probably less than some of your coaches mm -hmm. if you're growing your business. You don't want to be taking money out of the business. The goal is to reinvest it back in the business. Let's play the infinite game, which we've talked about on this, not the finite game. We're trying to kick ass in 10 years. For that to happen, we have to invest today. What we're trying not to do is pull the money out of the business and let the business stay stagnant. Mm -hmm. Put it back in, put it back in, put it back in. What you're doing is you're investing into your platform. And this is a physical platform, which yeah. is so cool because they actually get to see the physical platform. Yeah. Um, it should be noted that uh, I think I've been coming around CFE regularly for since 2015. And I don't know that there's ever been a period where you haven't been improving something in the gym, like dramatically, like dramatically. at times, sometimes subtle, but sometimes like there's holes in the walls because we're trying to figure out how we're going to knock this thing down. And even, even now, like you guys are painting, you just painted the outside, you got solar panels. Like it is, it's really not something. And it, it's something that I think people want to believe that like, okay, I did my branding and I'm done now. But branding is like fitness in the sense that you're actually, you're never done. And I, I think that thinking about your facility is a great, your specific facility is a great example of how the branding at CFE is, it's never done. Because after you finish this, you'll find something else. Yeah, right? uh, we, have, we have a list of about a, a, a dozen and a half to two dozen items that we're constantly always, and that the list doesn't go away. Right. As things get knocked off, <laughs> yeah, new, new things are yeah. coming on. Yeah. All right, next question. One word, you better be able to do this one within two minutes. One word to define success. Proud. Next question. How do you Ooh, get- Wow, we're just moving. Yeah, I just moving that. on. How do you get members to show up early and on time for class? We have problems with veterans arriving five to 10 minutes late, which disrupts the warm up. How do we change those habits and shift our gym culture? The gym owners are hesitant about punishment late burpees. Yeah, they should be hesitant about that. that. What you do not want to do is, um, um, so we talk the emotional bank account, right? Yeah. Which is like, it works the same way as a regular bank account does, but it's with people's emotions. Well, what we want to do is put deposits in there and grow that. If someone comes in and they're they're late and you say like, hey, you have to do a burpee for every minute you're late. Well, is that going to be a deposit or withdrawal? Now, the, the argument to that is, well, I want to be able to run a disciplined thing. And I want if I was a martial arts studio, we'd start on time and people would be on time. I, I get that. Yes, absolutely. What you can do there is have one-on-one -on -one conversations. And what might come to light there is if you sincerely listen to these people is that they're trying really hard. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and if you punish them for coming late, so I'll use, I coach the 830 class. My wife is late every day for the 830 class. She loves CrossFit. She yeah. loves taking my class. She physically, she can, she's also a long time member. 
She can not get there based off the bus schedule any earlier than 8.35. It's an impossibility. Now imagine if I, she knew every single time she walked in the door, I was going to punish her, single her out for that. Yeah. I think she might second guess coming a lot of the time. Yep. So what we're doing is we're putting an additional mental barrier to entry before people walk in the door. We should be doing everything we can to get people to walk through the door. When our members walk through the door late, they walk in and they say, I'm so sorry. And I say, I'm just glad you're here. Yep. Like I, like if you're here for 10 minutes or you're here for 30 minutes or you're here for three classes in a row, I'm just psyched you're here. That's what we want. Thank you for being here. Now, if it comes to the point where it's disruption, well, let's figure out how good of a coach you are that you get yeah. thrown off your rails from somebody walking through the door three minutes late and you can't get that person to be integrated in the class seamlessly. Let's work on that aspect of it more so than this individual is doing something wrong. Mm. Take ownership of it. Take on it. Yeah. Make it make like, it a part of your yeah. what is the what is the what is the end state goal you're trying to create? Now I get it. If you're trying to create this like dojo like atmosphere where it's about discipline and yes, that then that's a place to have that. If you're trying to give people the best hour of their day, like that's not that's not a bad thing. Now, if they're walking in, they truly are being disruptive. Like they walk in yeah. and it's like they're you know, they're pushing people out of the way or whatever it is, then you have a one-on-one conversation. Yeah. Next question, when does a competitive athlete at the sanctionals or regionals level need to go off of template programming and get one-on-one -on -one coaching slash programming? When, two things, when a uh, weakness is so obvious that it's holding them back or when they have the availability to work with a stud coach. Mm. Other than that- Not just any coach, but somebody- stud, yeah, yeah, just because you can work with a coach doesn't mean it's, you know, so I have the ability to work with an accountant. Great. Well, the accountant right. might be crappy. It doesn't mean I should work with an right. accountant. Yep. You know, um, but if it's an amazing account that knows all the you know the tax implications of everything across the entire you know platform, that's amazing. So um, if there's a major weakness, let's say somebody's trying to um, compete at sanctionals, and sanctionals now like almost every single one has swimming involved, yeah, and they can't swim to the end of a pool. Well, they're not going to be able to follow a regular competitive program because there's not enough swimming for them to get better at it. They can follow it as the base of the program, but they need to layer in additional weakness work. We don't call it weakness work. We call it focus work mm -hmm. because that implies that you're weak and we want to be focusing on things. Words matter. Words matter. Um, from there, the next opportunity would be like you can work with a stud coach that's going to do more for you than that individual pr program could. That would be a phenomenal opportunity. Having said that, we've had a lot of our athletes, Amanda Barnhart's, a lot of our athletes, Amanda Barnhart, Katrin David's daughter, um, Katrin, um, when she won the games the first time, was following comptrain.com. Mm -hmm. um, Amanda Barnhart, um, just watch, watch some of the videos we've done on her, went from like deep in the open to qualifying for the games to becoming top 10 following comptrain.com. She also has the ad benefit. She works with a great coach, Mitch, that can additionally put in some um, weakness work, focus work for her. Um, uh, kind of random, but popped into my head. If you had to estimate the number of coaches with it, it, across the, the CrossFit Games uh, landscape who you would consider a stud coach, is that 10 people? Is there 20? Is there 50 people who well, are- I don't even know how many people are. Can we talk percentage-wise maybe? Sure. Or maybe, no. I mean, well, not, not in terms of like athletes, but like actual coaches. coaches. So like, if there's- if there's, I'm uh, just curious if you- like, Are yeah. we at a stage of the game where there are 100 stud coaches who, who all of these athletes could potentially reach out to, or is the pool still really, really small? Well, stud is also relative, right? So yeah. it's relative to your needs. That's so yep. if you are a complete beginner, somebody that is Completely. halfway through their their coaching journey yep. is a stud a to you. Yep. Yes. Yep. Um, but at the CrossFit Games level, yeah. for that people at the you know CrossFit Games level, weird now there's 150 athletes yeah. on the guys and girls side. Yep. But maybe we use previous years like where there's 40 guys. How many uh, 40 guys, 40 girls? How many stud coaches are coaching those 80 athletes? Um. Probably fifty percent of those are studs. Mm, got it. There's 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 so, a lot of good coaches out there yeah. now. Cool. Um, next question. Any idea why I might always be getting a cold when I train at high intensity or high volume? Um, any ideas? Yes. 
Any ideas? Is that the, is that the correct? They, they, they're asking they, if I have ideas. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Any idea why they might be getting okay. sick? Got it. <laughs> uh, overtraining. Yeah. So what you do when you're talking about in, um, intensity and volume, those are including with duration um, and frequency. Those are the factors at play for um, the overall stimulus of your training program. And they're probably the two biggest, right? Intensity and volume. When those go up, you get sick. Mm. Being sick is a indicator of overtraining. It's one of the, the symptoms of it. And what we need to do is either lower your intensity or volume, <laughs> shocker, yep. or keep it the same, but focus on the other five factors of fitness. Mm. You more can sleep, increase, sleep. yeah, for sure. More sleep, better mindset, better nutrition, better, all those things. Or if you do those things, better recovery. You do those things and you might be able to handle those volumes, got but it. you can't burn the candle at all different ends of the, you know, you gotta, someone's gonna give. Got it. Last question I've got for today. How do you get people motivated and excited to sign up for the open? A lot of people find it hard to justify the 20 bucks to sign up, even though it's not that much compared to the benefits that come from it. There are also people at my gym who tell others not to sign up for the open. I was wondering, what can you tell naysayers or if there's anything to say at all? I would, um, so I've gone full circle, uh, not for us, 180 on this. So mm -hmm. I guess it's half circle. Yep. That's weird that's saying, right? Full circle, full circle means right you're end up, yeah. Yeah, I'm not right back where I started. No. So I've gone 180 on yep. this. Um, Back in the day, we were a competitive CrossFit gym. And my thought process was if we were a running club, I would want all of our members to sign up for a 5K yep. because there's so much to be learned from getting out of your comfort zone and so much to be gained by doing this as a community together. And we want to enter races and do this as a group together. So what we used to do is try to get every single one of our members to sign up for the open. And we did a really good job. There was a couple of years we had about 98% uh, uh, participation. Right. Yep. I have since turned a 180 on this. I do not encourage my members to sign up for the open. I'm not gonna say I dissuade it, but um, if someone's on the fence, I would ask them what their goals are. And if it has nothing to do with competitive CrossFit, I would ask them, um, I, would, I would push them not to sign up. Mm -hmm. I don't believe the most of our members should be competing in the sport. I think most of our members would benefit from um, being coached. Mm -hmm. And if someone is competing, this is what we've talked about before, about the difference between training, practice, training, and competition. When someone is in competition, I don't have the opportunity to be like, hey, let's let's not use the 95 pounds on the snatch today, Let's use, which I would do every other day. Yep. Because I can't, because yep. they're doing a competition and it's set for them. Yep. I can't say, slow down, you're moving poorly because the goal is to move faster. Mm -hmm. I can't say we're not ready to try a ring muscle up. Like it's fair game. The go like I can't play my role as a coach when they are trying to compete. Mm -hmm. I do, a coach's role is in training and competition. And then for competitors, a coach can coach in competition. But most of these people are not there to compete. Mm -hmm. They're there to get better for the long haul. So we um, do not encourage our members to sign up for the open. That's all I've got for today. Thank you to everybody who sends me questions. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Patrick. See everybody next week. You can get every episode of Chasing Excellence wherever you listen to your podcasts or on YouTube. Until next time, thank you for listening.